We're now on the second half of uh, chapter four, toward an inclusive uh, liturgy of destruction. And uh, Professor Ellis, thank you again for um, uh, doing this conversation uh, with me. I hope you are uh, feeling okay. Have yes, I am. Well? I am. Thank you. And uh, I'm glad to be here and Hope that we can keep it nice and calm today. I've been a little bit hot under the collar the last few conversations, so I'm going to try to be calm and peaceful. Okay, well, we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's uh, dive in. Um, so this uh, part of the conversation uh, would uh, focus on the on including the Palestinian voices uh, in this whole uh, na narration of uh, Jewish uh, history or the, uh, or the liturgy of destruction. Okay, let me... I looked at your resume, uh, which I have a copy, and then and I, I was just uh, curious about, you know, uh, how busy you were uh, at this time, and then I, I saw this. I mean, uh, and, and these are just you know, a tiny, a tiny bit of that uh, whole uh, speaking tour. So, uh, for so you were, you were going around and uh, speaking uh, uh, all over. I was, and uh, each one that you've noted here, which is one of many carries its own story uh, and I could uh, I, I remember a lot of it quite vividly both the audiences I talked to uh, the opposition I ran into and uh, in Glasgow I remember uh, it was a big audience and there was uh, a rabbi in the back who was acting out while I was speaking and finally, I, uh, he was giggling and he was talking to somebody. And uh, finally, I, I said, uh, what is your problem, rabbi? He had a kippah, and I assumed he was a rabbi, which he was. And he said, well, you, you know, you're saying that Jews in Israel are torturing Palestinians. I said, yeah, I just uh, I'm on my way back from Israel, Palestine, and that's what we know. State Department, the U.S. State Department, Palestinian sources, and Israeli human rights groups. He said, but that's ridiculous. Jews don't do those things. And I, I looked up, and again, it was a big audience with a theater seating. And I said, I see. Jews don't do such things. So I'm lying. And he said, yes, you are. And I wrote a poem after that titled A Rabbi in Scotland. Uh, there aren't many. And it was published. Uh, and uh, yeah, so all of these, these talks, many of them I remember very specifically. And I would meet people for many years after who were at one of those talks. And they remembered everything very vividly too. So it was an electric atmosphere how dare a Jew speak this way? And others were saying, "Is could that be true? Could Jews act that way? Uh, so, uh, and uh, I was just fresh from these experiences in the hospital, as I talked about last time, uh, seeing these kids on ventilators, brain dead. Um, but I was bringing a message back and I went all over the world in Zimbabwe. <laughs> You know, the Ecumenical Association of Third World Theologians really didn't allow Jews to speak in general, but they did ask me in Zimbabwe, and I flew there. And Naima Tik, who we'll talk about later, was supposed to be there, but the Palestinian group couldn't get out. Israel wouldn't let them out. And uh, the first day I was in Zimbabwe, a car drove up, a driver asked uh, if I was Mark Ellis, and I said yes. Uh, it turned out that the Palestinian, the PLO ambassador to Zimbabwe, which was the most important post at that time, right next to apartheid South Africa, wanted to speak with me. So I got in the car 
And I spent three or four nights speaking for hours with the uh, Palestinian ambassador to Zimbabwe, who was a revolutionary. He was an active political and had never been in Palestine. He was born in a Lebanese refugee camp, mm -hmm. but he knew every street in Palestine. And we had these long discussions about what does it mean to be Jewish? And he finally said to me, he said, you talk about the Jewish people how do you have a sense of peoplehood? You live all over the world. I said, uh, you've never been to Palestine, have you? He said, you're right. But I said, you know every street in Palestine, don't you? He said, yes, I do. I said, well, there's a Palestinian people too, isn't there? Now the interesting, the funny part, there were some funny parts about this. When I went to Zimbabwe, I was going then to Tanzania and Kenya and I didn't think anyone, I was a nobody. So I just brought a pair of comfortable sneakers to wear, who cared? And there I am starting to go to the Palestinian ambassador's place. And he was then having parties to, to meet with me and I'm in my sneakers. And every time uh, he, he would comment on it, he had a good sense of humor. And uh, so I was the Jewish theologian in sneakers and he was the Palestinian ambassador and we got on very well. And it was quite, a, quite an experience. Uh, so each one of these lectures, and they were usually tours. So if you list one, there may have been 10 talks. Um, and uh, I remember almost all. And then of course, going into Cyprus, which we'll come back to later on the Middle East Council of Churches. Mm -hmm. I remember flying into Larnaca, and uh, this is just another example. I, got a call from uh, Gabby Habib, we'll come to him in a minute, on the phone long distance from Cyprus, would I come to Cyprus? And I said, well, okay. And uh, I said, uh, when? He said, well, in a couple of weeks. I said, in a couple of weeks? He said, I'll send you a ticket. And uh, I was to be flown into Larnaca, which if I remember correctly, was an hour or two from Limassol, which is where they had their headquarters. And I said to him, this is long distance. This is before iPhones and all of, again, all of this is before this stuff. And I said, he said, we'll have a driver pick you up. And at that point, I began to think about my own safety for the first time. And I said, well, how will I know who it is that will be picking me up? He said, we'll have a sign. He'll have a sign, Mark Ellis. And I thought, how will I know who has that sign? <laughs> anyway, you had to go without thinking about your own safety because, or what would be said about Jews or how you might feel. Because if everything was checked off in advance and you made sure that you were safe and everyone would speak to you in quote the proper way, you couldn't go into somebody else's territory, which is what I need to do needed to do. So each one of these tours has a series of stories that are very interesting. And most of them, I recall quite vivid groups. Uh, there was, uh, at that time, I was one of the few people speaking on this issue, especially from tradition and mm -hmm. a theological uh, sensibility. And uh, and the only one really that spoke directly and honestly. But I was also traveling, traveling not like Elmer Berger traveled. This is that uh, anti-Zionist groups uh, in the 1950s and 60s with a sense of diaspora Jewishness. And this is very important. I was traveling with Holocaust theology and the need for an empowered Jewish presence. This was more difficult for people, but because they felt I was authentic, they listened and we dialogued. So I was not coming to them with Israel is only terrible. Israel should be destroyed. I'm a Jew who doesn't believe in uh, empowerment. I, I wasn't doing any of that. I was carrying the message as I write it in this book, which was a new message for many to hear and sometimes a more difficult message, but one which people recognized was the new reality, and then the dialogues took on a very uh, important and energetic manner. 
okay. of the so, of uh, uh, Beyond Innocence and Redemption in Arabic. And this was, uh, uh, I think, published by the Middle East uh, Council of Churches. Uh, can, can you tell more? Is this the only book that uh, you have that has been translated to Arabic? Well, Toward a Jewish Theology of Liberation was translated into uh, 10 languages or so. Uh -huh. uh, but, but this is the only book that I know of. Sometimes I would arrive someplace and the book had been translated without me knowing it. But this is the only book uh, that I know of that was translated into Arabic and published. There was another book of mine, Out of the Ashes, a Pluto Press book, that was translated into Arabic, but uh, the publishing house uh, was destroyed in one of the bombing raids uh, in Lebanon that Israel carried out. It wasn't uh, carried out to destroy my book. But uh, so there were really two translations, but I don't think the second translation ever made it. Uh, so Beyond Innocence and Redemption is the only book in Arabic that was published as far as I know. And that happened uh, with Gabi Habib, who invited me to the Middle East Council of Churches. And then I arrived. And again, this is another story. These are encounters. I encountered these Pal Palestinian kids in hospitals. I was there during the uprising, during the blackouts, during the curfews, meeting with people. Uh, but here now I was in uh, Cyprus. And the, I was asked to meet with a group of Arab and Palestinian Christian theologians. And I said, okay, I'll do that. And I was supposed to uh, begin speaking with them the day after I arrived. I'd rest that night and start, but they had to leave to go back, it turned out. And so I arrived in the afternoon and he asked if I could speak to them within an hour or so. So I said, well, look, let me take a shower. It's a long ride from the United States to Cyprus. And I did take a shower and I went down and I remember the room there were about 20 or 30 Arab and Palestinian Christian theologians, and I was seated in the middle and they were around me. And uh, of course I was very young and naive. I didn't know a thing about Middle Eastern Christian theology or churches and uh, I, I was totally ignorant. And they started out with them introducing themselves, you know, just a brief introduction. <laughs> As they went around, Jew from America, what, what could he say to us? Uh, we're living through Israeli power because Israeli power didn't hit only Palestinians. It hit Syria and Lebanon and Egypt. It hit everywhere. So these people were not really uh, so enamored about meeting a young uh, Jew from America. What could I say to them? And there was a negative vibe in the room. It wasn't that they were bad people. They were just, they were tired. They wanted to go home and who am I? And the question was, who am I? Which I also asked myself sitting there. Uh, and uh, we started out and there were a couple of negative comments. And then I think it was Naima Tik, whom we'll also talk about in a few minutes, who said, listen to him, it's important. And then it changed. And we had a two to three hour discussion about what does it mean to be Jewish, Holocaust theology, what is Israel doing? Uh, what does this mean, uh, the Jewish Christian dialogue? So it was very intense. Out of that intensity, and I was in Cyprus several times, the Middle East Council brought me several times, uh, they decided to translate and publish my book in Arabic. Now, I had no idea what that would mean, but uh, if you look in the archives, I hope it's in my archives, and I haven't looked at them in a long time. Uh, in Al Haram, which was the, the big Egyptian newspaper, and this is when the newspapers were really big in, in size and beautifully printed, uh, there was a full page, which again is probably twice the size of a page in the New York Times now, of quotes from my book and reflections on my book, and I think in Syria, in Jordan, uh, in the Jordan time. So it went all around the Arab world. And of course, what was in the Arab world was also uh, got into Israel. Yeah. Uh, so it was quite big um, and much, I, I used to receive letters with uh, parts of these 
articles. And um, so uh, it became quite, quite the scene. And again, it was, I think, the first Jewish theology book in modern times published in Arabic, uh, I would assume. Um, and there was an encyclopedia, which I've never seen, done on contemporary figures, uh, theological figures, which has a big uh, discussion of my work. Uh, I've never seen it. So a lot of this stuff that went on uh, when I, before I arrived and after I arrived in these places, I never saw. Again, we didn't have the email and uh, the Facebook. Uh, so I'm only aware of what was uh, sent to me or what I discovered later. But uh, that's how the book came uh, together. And it would be important actually for a republication of the book with a new forward by me and maybe by others. And I've understand that it's very, very beautiful Arabic, which is not simple. So I'm very uh, proud uh, of that encounter and how generous ultimately the people of the Middle East Council of Churches were with me considering, and this was another shift that we had to understand and I had to endure my idea of Jewish and their experience of Jewish were completely different. These people did not want to hear from Jews, not because they were anti-Semitic, but because their experience of Jews in Israel and the Jewish establishment in the United States was so negative that it was hard for them to listen to a Jew, not anti-Semitism. It was their experience. So when I went into these encounters, many of them around the world, I had to endure things said about Jews and views of Jews, which I would consider anti-Semitic in a different place, like in the West, which I also experienced that. And I had a different tolerance. If it happened in the West, I called it out immediately. If it happened in the Arab world, I had to listen. I didn't have to accept. I had to ask myself, what are they saying to me? What are they trying to say? And what does it mean? These are two different experiences, but most Jews, when they heard this kind of language would say, oh, they hate Jews. Mm -hmm. But if you're being bombed out of a village mm -hmm. or a city, say Beirut, and I would meet people who had withstood and survived the bombing of Beirut. I met them in Cyprus too, and here's another part. I was having dinners in Cyprus with Palestinians who had been displaced in 1948, in 1967, and who had gone to Lebanon and were displaced in Lebanon. These were highly cultured, educated, and sometimes well-to-do Arabs and Palestinians who had borne the brunt of Israeli power. And of course, in, in Cyprus, this was again <clears throat> a long time ago, when you had dinner, you went to a restaurant at seven o'clock and you left at midnight. These were not just, uh, you know, one hour in and out dinners. And I was sitting with and eating with people who were so generous, but who had suffered so much from Israel that their acceptance of me, their ability to see me for what I was rather than what I represented to them. Uh, and this was an experience of very few Jews had or have ever had. And so I was encountering our enemy whom we had oppressed, who accepted me. And I realized not only their humanity, but their dignity. Yeah, that must be a very uh, powerful and moving experience too. Uh, and also I, I, I it's, it's, a, uh, it's an experience of uh, a healing in a way. Well, but then the question was, how do you speak this to people who are ignorant of this, who've never had this experience? How do you say to David Roskies, listen, they're worthy. There are, they're victims of our power. They have dignity. They now have a say. 
Most Jews didn't want to go. They didn't have the possibility. But how did I get the possibility by doing it? So then the, mess, the question was, how did I take this experience of having this dinner in Cyprus for five hours with lovely people who had been so impacted by Jewish power in Israel and bring that back to people who never had that experience, didn't want that experience and wouldn't take it if it was offered. So healing, I, I don't, you say healing, I don't know how, my, my experience of it was somewhat like the kids in the hospital. They think that I'm a conduit for a change because what I represent is important to them, but it's not gonna change. So very, very, um, I wouldn't say healing, it was another cognitive dissonance. I didn't have any negative feeling toward Arabs or Palestinians. I didn't know enough to have any feelings. It was, I wasn't raised pro or con. So I was experiencing, it's sort of a, not a blank slate, but somewhat. But I knew what others felt when I talked about Palestinians as fully human, civilized, able to think ethically, all of these things which are obvious. It wasn't obvious to Jews and many others that I spoke to uh, and I was often called a liar for bringing back uh, messages that even the Israeli human rights community had, you know, finally signed on to. The Amer U.S. State Department, which was so pro-Israel in many ways. So uh, cognitive dissonance um, all around. And how do you what how do you bring the message back, the simple message that they're fully human, civilized think ethically, what are we doing to them and who have we become? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I was thinking maybe they, aside from uh, the accusing you of being a liar, they, they must have thought you're, it's either you're naive or you have been brainwashed. Yes, of course, and then, or that I'm uh, being paid by them. I mean, I have had everything said, uh, it's so interesting. They would talk about uh, Arab oil money, that I was getting Arab oil money. And I said, you know, it's so interesting. First of all, I could use a little money, but I haven't been offered any Arab oil money. But doesn't this sound like Jewish money? The same thing we don't like to hear? What do you mean? Or Arab? By the way, where do you get your income? I don't get any Arab oil money, but where does your income come from? And how do you like it when people talk about, oh, you've been bought off by Jewish money? And there were people who tried to, Jews who tried to buy me off. Really? And I have stories. Yes, and I'll just give you one story. Leon Klinecki, who was uh, very big in uh, the Jewish Christian dialogue and very high up. And I don't know if he was his background, uh, but I know he was active in Argentina and elsewhere. And in a sense, back the dictatorship there. And uh, there's a whole story about him and I don't remember all of it, but I got a call from him once on Thanksgiving at home. I don't know how he got my home number. Again, no Google, no this or that. And uh, it was a holiday. It didn't bother me that he called me at home, but uh, he was talking to me uh, about what I was saying in public and writing. And I remember him saying, you know, Mark, we could open many doors for you. I remember that. We could open many doors for you. And when he said that, I asked myself, and what is behind those doors? So, yes, I was... Uh, what, did you, what did you suspect to be behind those doors? Well, he meant that I could be have a, a cushy life. I could be promoted into, I don't know what exactly, but basically like the Jewish establishment would take care of me. Now, whether they would have or not, he, this is his offer. I, I don't know what it meant specifically because I didn't say, okay, good. Now tell me what you'll do because I'm willing to be quiet. By the way, not 100% quiet, that they didn't need that. And not even 50% quiet that 10 or 20%, which is the difference. If I had dropped that, 
I could have been taken care of. In other words, he was offering me, without detail because I didn't ask him, a future. And the other side of it was, if I didn't shut up, those doors would be closed and other doors too. And of course at Marinol where I was teaching, the general council was called to a meeting by parts of the Jewish establishment, maybe Klinecki too, I don't know, in New York. And they went down and the idea was, Marinol was huge, a Catholic group. Uh, they, their magazine went out to a million Catholics and very vivid magazine every month. So it was a big deal. And when they saw me there and me writing toward a Jewish theology of liberation, they wanted to shut that down. And Mary Noel was called down and they went. But actually Mary Noel never told me, it was only behind the scenes that I heard about it. And Mary Noel listened to them and didn't say a word to me. So there was also support. Mary Noel was very supportive of my work um, uh, because they saw me as an authentic person and Jew but there was pressure from the beginning to shut me up and shut the issue down, not just with me and Marinol, but all over. But I would became a, a focal point for them of interest. Uh, I didn't quite understand why at the time, but uh, there was from the Jewish establishment from the beginning, they were hunting Jewish dissenters and they wanted to shut it down and they were offering an open door, which in retrospect, maybe I should have taken, who knows? I mean, God, but then who would I have been? And, but there were, did take yeah, it. who would you have been? <laughs> yeah, that's quite life, yeah. isn't it? Yes, yeah, that, yeah. And that's, uh, those are the, the, the choices that we make that could make or break us, I think. Yeah, well, choices we make can also make or break us in other ways. So you have the make or break. Uh, but uh, I wasn't interested, not because I'm above others or I have the, you know, it's just it's, it's ridiculous. How could you live as a teacher and writer and as a person, as a Jew of conscience and not speak? But they were singling out those who were speaking, especially Jewishly. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, let's uh, look at the other uh, 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 things in the second half of the of chapter four. Uh, and uh, so, uh, the, in the first half, where we were talking about, you know, the absence of Palestinian voices in the liturgy of destruction. Uh, and uh, and uh, now, uh, and then there were already Jews that were trying to include their voices. But uh, as you said, there's nothing like uh, uh, hearing the voices of Palestinians themselves. And and these are, um, and you said that uh, 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 there were already Palestinian intellectuals, uh, including uh, later we'll talk about Said, who have uh, begun talking about. Uh, this history uh, that is being created, and uh, for example, these two uh, the two books, uh, uh, Walid Khalidi uh, before their diaspora, which is a, a, a photographic uh, history of uh, Palestine, and also the sociologist Elia Zurich, uh, uh, which uh, in your book, uh, he uh, divided the, it was also a reading of the, the Palestinian history, uh, which he, he divided it into five stages, but really focusing on the internal colonialism. Uh, and then uh, it's interesting because he said that the future trend, the future of, uh, Jew, of uh, Palestinian life in Israel would be total control that the population of Palestinians through expulsion and emigration uh, and uh, uh, the resettlement of Palestinians in Arab countries. And uh, that was quite uh, really prophetic. So yes, you, and I, you actually met uh, uh, Professor Walid Khalidi. Uh, I said. did at 
conferences, and I met both at conferences, but I wasn't uh, introduced to them as, uh, I was just introduced. But uh, I was coming across, um, I was not only visiting in Cyprus, these Arab and Palestinian folks who had been displaced and displaced and displaced and having these luscious dinners with them, they were affluent and they were educated and they were highly cultured and that, you know, you felt like a person from the United States that you weren't cultured at all compared, you know, so I was meeting, but I was also in Palestine meeting Palestinian intellectuals and educators and feminists and organizers and cultural folks and all sorts of very interesting people. And I was the first uh, Jewish theologian, maybe the only one, uh, certainly for many years, to let Palestinians speak. And as they spoke, I was listening because I had never heard them speak or read them like most Jews. So I was, again, discovering their independent voice and simply saying, here as I hear it is their independent voice, not just saying, what do I think of their independent voice or how would I interpret their independent voice? I could do that, but first I had to think, let them speak. And Jewish theology and Jewish consciousness and Holocaust theology and Jews needed to listen to Palestinians speak their story. Uh, and that is also a way of interrupting our narrative. Not that we shouldn't have a Jewish narrative, but it now has to be informed by Palestinians. And before their diaspora, you're looking at this photographic uh, book with a point. Palestinians had a real life before us. They have a real life now. It was highly developed. It wasn't simply a group of peasants, which is the way Jews would look at it, or people who weren't there, which is how Jews often looked at it. This was a, a society with a lot of diversity uh, and its ups and downs and its highs and lows. And it was a real life. Maybe that was the message that what we had done was conquer real life. And what we had done to real life was to minimize it and to degrade it. Uh, but that life is captured. And then this internal colonialism, this whole idea, again, a sociologist, a Palestinian sociologist. Mm -hmm. And I began to meet these folks and still meet them today who actually have an independent view of what Palestinians are. And for Jews, many Jews, that's awfully surprising even today. Uh, because how could they have their own view? They are less than us. Well, I was encountering Palestinians all over the place that uh, not only were not less than us, some of them appeared to be above us. And certainly in their behavior, uh, because we were the civilized ones who were doing uncivilized things to the uncivilized who were actually civilized. This is the, <laughs> now again, it seems simple. But if you ask yourself if there were Palestinians in Jewish theology before this, the answer is no. There's some now, but uh, much of that is what I call a constituency conversion, uh, where they had to, had to include Palestinians to stay relevant uh, in progressive movements, because everyone now is demanding that Jews who were known speak favorably about Palestinian solidarity. When I was speaking about it, uh, it seemed like an outrage. Uh, one of the lectures I gave that you cited in the 1988-1991 framework is solidarity with the Palestinian people. That was seen as outrageous uh, for a Jew to say that. What could that mean? Is that against Jewish? For me, it was on behalf of Jewish history. Now everyone says it. Well, not everyone. But yeah. at what cost? It is generally accepted to be progressive, if you, if you uh, say that. Yes, well, you have to now. Uh, so uh, I don't really trust. It's not that, uh, it's not a question of trust. When you speak, prominent Jews speak like this 25 or 30 years after I did, you have to ask yourself, where were they? Did I have some kind of special, uh, 
antenna that uh, it, was I so special that I could see it that no one else could see it? I don't, I, I reject that. And why didn't they go among Palestinians? Why did it take them so long? And why did it take so long to publish their thoughts that they may have had before? What was it, out of fear? Uh, was it uh, because their constituency, progressive constituency was highly Jewish and those Jews weren't ready and they didn't want to lose their following? This is one of the issues about thinkers that have followings. It's just like a singer who has a following. You have to worry about that following once you have one. But I never had a following, so I never had to think about it. Yeah, maybe that's good. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go to the... Uh... Let's go back to the screen and uh, and here we have one of the most disruptive uh, <laughs> thinkers uh, in uh, in terms of uh, uh, not just Palestinian history but generally uh, Western history and uh, and here is a, a quote from the question of Palestine. Um, you actually mentioned two of his books in the, in the book, uh, The Question of Palestine and After the Last Sky. And in fact, uh, uh, Saeed actually look, uh, studied the, the writings of Khalidi and uh, Zurich. Uh, and here, uh, I'd like to read a, a quote from uh, The Question of Palestine. Uh, there is a Palestinian people. And here, I think the basic point is Palestinians exist. Uh, I think that's, but even that, to argue about that was really, you know, it must be, uh, it's, uh, it's. Uh, Believe me, there, there was a big argument about that in the West. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, because probably because now I'm uh, I'm I'm uh, thinking about I mean that's the basic argument that Palestinians exist. Okay, so here's the quote: There is a Palestinian people. There is an Israeli occupation of Palestinian lands. There are Palestinians under Israeli military occupation. There are Palestinians, six hundred fifty thousand of them, who are Israeli citizens and who constitute 15% of the population of Israel. There is a large Palestinian population in exile. These are actualities which the United States and most of the world have directly or indirectly acknowledged, which, too, which Israel too has acknowledged, if only in the forms of denial, rejection, threats of war, and punishment. The Palestinians will continue to exist and they will continue to have their own ideas about who represents them, where they want to settle, and where they want to do with their national and political future. Okay, so uh, Saeed's uh, uh, the thinking was very important uh, the, in, the, in developing your uh, thoughts on inclusive liturgy of destruction. Yes, and uh, it's again, it's, you know, there is this, there is that, this is a fact, and you can deny it and reject it, but everybody knows it. Again, we think this is really, why do you have to say this? It was explosive. Uh, and uh, it was highly debated. And even among Jewish progressives, Saeed had these arguments with Jewish uh, progressives who acknowledged parts of this, but were so defensive that they wouldn't listen to Palestinians' self-definition. They needed to define Palestinians as well as Jews. So Saeed had these battles with Jewish progressives, and that's how I met him. Uh, and uh, again, uh, this was very personal. And it wasn't that I met him at a conference. I met him through a letter that he sent to me. He had read an article that I had written in the Journal of Palestine Studies. And uh, he wrote a letter to me, and I received it at my home in Ossining. And it was an old home, a very small home. And I remember there was a, the, the box where the letters were put were right on outside the door, not, not independent on the uh, sidewalk. And you would just open the screen door, and you would take the letters out. 
And I remember getting the letter and looking at it, the letter and it said, Dr. Mark Ellis, my address. And then the address where the sender was Columbia University. And on the top was written, handwritten, Saeed. And I thought to myself, that's got to be Edward Saeed. Did he just send me a letter? And uh, he did. He sent me a letter thanking me for my article in the Journal of Palestine Studies and hoping to meet me someday that he wanted to talk with me. And I remember bringing the letter inside, opening the envelope and just staring at it. Uh, uh, so that began the that started my relationship with Edward Said. And again, so this was, I read him, of course, I knew of him and he was very difficult to encounter. He had secretaries and all, he was a very elite and a prominent person uh, at Columbia University. And I thought to myself, why does he want to meet me? Uh, and part of the reason was he was very pro-Jewish in many ways. It wasn't an anti-Jewish bone in his body. Uh, and he was very frustrated with Jewish progressives like de Kuhn and others and Daniel Boyarin. He had a big fight with the Boyarins. And, uh, and he recognized in me something different. Uh, and I started a relationship with him uh, that has very... Uh, beautiful moments to it. Uh, and um, we can talk about that, but uh, he became very uh, important, of course, very important in Palestinian life and ultimately in Jewish life. And of course, around the world for his work uh, by Jews. He felt that he wasn't being allowed and Palestinians weren't being allowed to speak independently but he saw in my writing something different. And I, be, I had felt something different, which is why I couldn't align myself with a lot of the Jewish progressives, but I didn't really know what it was, except that I, I had to go my own way. And Saeed was helping or pointing to me, pointing out to me what was different. So I was learning. See, I learned a lot from Palestinians. How can Jews learn from Palestinians? That was a question. Sort of like Christians finally waking up and saying, you know, we can learn from Jews. How about that? You know, or we can learn from African Americans. Oh, really? Yeah, well, it's just, it's just this mind boggling sense that we can learn from those whom we've had displaced and oppressed, and they may actually be more civilized than we are and some better educated and higher culture and actually quite decent, which we think we are, but which we're not acting that way. So that was the beginning of my relationship with Saeed. And I have a few stories which are very, very deep with me. Uh, when he started to calling me Rabbi Mark Ellis and uh, things like that. And I, I, I pointed out to him that this is when he was dying and uh, it was in Jerusalem and he had given a major lecture. I was giving one of the side ones and I had heard him uh, refer to me on the radio as in one of his lectures as Rabbi Mark Ellis. And I always wanted to make it clear to people who called me rabbi, of which many did. I'd arrive at a place, there'd be a poster, come here, Rabbi Mark Ellis. I said, well, wait a minute. I never said I was a rabbi and I didn't want the Jewish establishment. It's probably because of the liturgy. <laughs> Yeah, well, they <laughs> want the Jewish establishment to think I was passing myself off as a rabbi. And not that the rabbis were speaking about justice. Not really. No. And uh, so Saeed started calling me rabbi. And maybe even in some written texts. I don't know. And so uh, he was very ill and he had been in Jerusalem and he was being taken back to his hotel room. And he was so ill that no one was supposed to talk to him at all just get back to the hotel room. He shouldn't even been traveling, but he kept going. And, but I ran into him in the basement and he said, oh, Mark, it's so good to see you. And I said, uh, Edward, I, I'd love to talk to you, but you can't. And his handlers were trying to get him away back to his hotel room. He said, no, I want to talk to Mark. So we were chatting and this and that. And I said, well, someday, but not now, Edward, I need to talk to you about the fact that you're calling me a rabbi. He says, well, what is the problem, Mark? 
And, and Saeed was a very dramatic, uh, you know, he was, was a prince, fantastic. Uh, and he had followers and he loved it. He said to me, he, uh, so I said, well, well, Edward, it's, it's not important, but you know, I'm not a, officially a rabbi and I don't want the Jewish establishment to think that I'm telling people. He said, oh, Mark, I feel so bad that I've made this mistake. I feel terrible that I, but really you are a rabbi. And he embraced me. <laughs> That's why you said he ordained you. Uh, Edward said that, you and, and this is, I, I went home and wrote about it. It was my first postmodern title. I am slash not a rabbi. I am or I am not a rabbi. And I meditated on the question, what is a rabbi or a Jewish leader at the end of ethical Jewish history. So I had many encounters with Saeed, uh, which were very meaningful to me. And yes, I often say, and, and I used to, during the uprising, uh, people would call me rabbi all the time. And I keep saying, no, I'm not a rabbi, no, I'm not a rabbi. But it became, they would then call me rabbi anyway. It's like they didn't hear me. Finally, somebody called me up and said, uh, Rabbi Ellis? And I finally said, yes, I just gave up. <laughs> So here was the question from coming from Palestinians. What were they saying to me about me? Not only what were they saying to me about what I needed to learn, but what, what did they see in me? What did they hope, what was their hope in me? And I had to not only learn from them about Palestinian life, about their analysis, I had to learn about how the oppressed saw Jews, sometimes in very negative light, sometimes in a positive light, and how they were receiving me. So it, the learning experience was not just, okay, now I understand more about Palestinian life, I'll write about it. It was a deep reckoning with who Jews are, who we are going to be, who are we called to be, and about myself. Um, so Saeed was pivotal in that. And then he wrote some very nice comments for my books, which are haunting to me and beautiful and very precious. Uh, my own sense is that Palestinians were able to see through the Jewishness we were presenting and tried to sift through it and understand what Jews were called to be. And Saeed was wonderful in that um, and very meaningful to me and many other Jews too. Now, speaking about, uh, you know, recognizing that uh, 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 the independent uh, voices of uh, Palestinian, how is that different? Uh, I, I mean, I was thinking because uh, we have been talking about progressive Jews that actually can, that are quite paternalistic. Um, uh, how, how do you actually uh, recognize the self-determination and the independence of uh, the voices of uh, those who are uh, victims of their power? Aside from giving them, uh, you know, giving them a platform to speak, uh, what else is, is needed? Well, um, that's an interesting question, and I have to think about it. Uh, I'm Jewish. I write from a Jewish perspective. I have a right to my own Jewishness and to communicate Jewishness as I see it, and other Jews do as well. Uh, and it's not to incorporate Palestinians into Jewish only and me define them. They have an independent existence. But I also have to see those whom we have oppressed uh, and sort out what, in, within the context of Jewish history, what I think can be done for Jews and others, and how we can begin to live a joint life, preserving our particularities, but also broadening our particularities to include each other. And this is what I mean by the broken middle of Jerusalem, which I developed later. Um, 
So recognizing them as other that is not other, recognizing their own independence and recognizing that I have an independence. And later on, uh, some Palestinians would say that Jews should be quiet and in a sense, go to the back of the bus. You've been too loud and too domineering in this discussion. I understand that. I don't accept it. Palestinians, of course, have a right to say that and to act upon it. But I have a right to speak within the context of Jewish history. But I can't do that without Palestinian voices that are not mine, but have their say in who I am. Do they determine who I am? No, they have a say in who I am. And I might have a say in who they are if we move toward a new history. Now, before uh, Edward Said ordained me as a rabbi, which is a very interesting ordination, uh, after the letter, I heard from him later that uh, he had been asked to review a book titled Tough Jews by the Washington Post. And he had agreed to do that. That was a big step forward that a Palestinian would be asked to review a book by a Jew. And it's a pretty good book, but not really about Israel, a little bit about Israel and about the militarization of Jewish life. And I remember reading the book. But he also asked if he could review with that Beyond Innocence and Redemption, which they refused. Now, if I remember correctly, in the review, he mentions Beyond Innocence and Redemption, but he wanted to review it as a book along with that book. Uh, and of course, that would have meant a lot for the publicity of the book, for the book getting around with his imprimatur which was very important internationally. It had a little bit because of the comments he made about me, which were used on my books. And it was mentioned, I believe in that review. But you asked the question, why didn't the Washington Post say yes? And the answer for me is they, and again, this is speculation, either with the title Beyond Innocence and Redemption, Confronting the Holocaust and Israeli Power, they felt that was way too strong for their taste, or they thought it was anti-Semitic, or they thought it might be seen by their readership as anti-Jewish. So there is Saeed being asked to review a book about Jews, which is critical of what's happening with Jews, very big advance, but holding back on a title that really spelled it out, confronting the Holocaust and Israeli power, my belief is they did it out of either self-censorship or the sense that they would be viewed in a negative light. And that's what happened with the book, published by a major publisher, Harper and Row, big time, big, big. But the sales were few, and it could have been the quality of the book. But I think it's because the title was so startling. That yeah, books actually, books that's one of my, that's one of the uh, mind-boggling things uh, about this book, uh, because uh, it is a very strong book, and I, and I have to agree with you that it is a better book than Toward the Jewish Theology of Liberation, because you know more, and, uh, you, and, and I think the most important part of this book is really the the in incorporation of Palestinian voices. And, uh, and this is very, uh, I, 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 I just felt that this book has not been given the, uh, it's, uh, its proper uh, recognition. Well, that's how many authors feel about their books, but yes, I feel that way. And I think the reality is, is that my title which is exactly what the book's about, was too strong. Uh, today, it would be recognized as real and appropriate. Uh, but 30 years ago, it was ahead of its time, uh, which is really good for a book in one way and not so good in another way. It, the title is scandalous, but also true. But even now, I think this will still sound scandalous. Yes, uh, for other, yes, I agree. Yeah, unfortunately, so. yeah.
Yeah. Well, this is because of the history that Jews suffered in the world. And the idea that Jews with power could cause other people to suffer, no one wants to talk about it. Or they want to talk about it for wrong reasons sometimes, sometimes for right reasons, but it's a very delicate subject. But it's unfortunate that it's also true. These are not conspiracy theories about Jews, of which there are many, and which are anti-Jewish. This is real use and, and abuse of power. This is not about Jewish conspiracies. This is about our present Jewish reality. And for many reasons, historical reasons, this is why Said has to say, the Palestinians do exist. Why do you have to argue that they exist? Israeli occupation is real. Why do you have to argue? Everybody can see that. What, what's the problem? What is, he's making simple statements. Why does he have to emphasize those statements? Because Jewish in public discussion is so fraught with historical memory and with ambivalence and anti-Semitism and philo-Semitism. It's... Uh, a Pandora's box to talk about Jews. And in the theological world, progressive theological world among Christians, Pandora's box. They don't want to hear about it either. They don't want to discuss it. They don't want to be labeled and they don't want to be sought out by the Jewish establishment. So there's a lot of power that tries to keep this language tamed and disciplined and buried. But the, Even well, what does the acknowledgement like, that the Palestinians exist, that the occupation is real. Why would that endanger uh, uh, Jewish uh, existence or Jewish uh, life? Because Jews have defined themselves in the West after the Holocaust as good, and in many ways we are. And that's an acceptable definition by people who originally, and for many, for over a thousand years, discriminated against us, that is Christians. Everyone needs to be, for Jews to be good, and Jews need to be seen as good, and we are good, but we're also not good. Maybe like everybody else. So you say, well, why can't you say, well, Jews are good, but they're doing something wrong? It seems obvious to say, which I say in my book, really, Jews are good, and we're doing something wrong. But because of the historical ramifications of public discourse about Jews, especially in the West, uh, people want to tamp that down. Jews want it tamped down. This was about the Jewish uprising during the Palestinian uprising. It, with all the news about what was going on, Jews felt we would be seen as doing something bad. Well, you say, well, Jews do good and bad things. But if you see Jews as doing bad things in public, it brings back historical memories, uh, especially of Christian Europe, and how we were seen as less than and uh, refusing the savior and killing the savior and all of this stuff. So Palestinians are caught there too. Uh, they have to argue their own existence within this whole history of Jewish anti-Semitism and Christian Christendom and all. It's unfair, but that's part of the uh, part of the deal. And of course, the Jewish establishment wants to keep that deal because it helps us but we're doing something wrong. It doesn't mean Jews are bad. It means we're doing something wrong. This is not, and of course there's a lot of ambivalence about Jews and some of the writing that have been very progressive uh, on behalf of Palestinians among Christians is either anti-Jewish, some of it, which I've called out, mm -hmm. uh, or deeply ambivalent about Jews. So this continues, but what do you do? What do Palestinians do? Do they say, well, I understand that Jews were discriminated against, so we'll just disappear. No. They actually want to live, and they don't want to live under this umbrella of Jewish history. And Jewish dissenters, some of them, also want Jews to live and Palestinians to live, but not under this umbrella of anti-Semitism or Jewish self-hate. And this is why Roski's was so embittered by my suggestion that we now had an inclusive liturgy of destruction. What was the problem? 
The idea was that these palaces, and that's the other side of it. What was said about Jews, we're uncivilized, we're not worthy, all of this stuff in Christian history, we refuse this, we refuse that. We now say about Palestinians in different ways. So it gets all mixed up for Jews and for Palestinians. And this is why it's fraught any discussion in public. It is indeed fraught. Okay, so uh, let's uh, move on to... Yeah, uh, yeah the, about the in Intifada and um, what it meant uh, for Palestinians. And this is, uh, and I think this is a response uh, to, because uh, those outside uh, Palestine, or maybe even in, among uh, Israelis, what, what you see are just, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uprising was all about this young man throwing stones or uh, very uh, violent uh, and, uh, uh, but actually, for well, you were discussing, you you discuss in this book that uh, for Palestinians, the uprising uh, meant uh, the shaking off of the occupation and all that it has meant politically, culturally, and psychologically. So it represents reclaiming self-respect and dignity as individuals and as a community. To assert these newfound strengths, Palestinians have concentrated on breaking with the occupation and rebuilding their own societal infrastructure. For many, the success of the uprising is due in large measure to the unity achieved through the creative and pragmatic responses of the Intifada leadership, as well as its emphasis on democratic decision-making. It has made clear that the resistance is intended to build a Palestinian state next to Israel, not to oppose or undermine the existence of Israel. Of course, this is a very different uh, presentation of the intifada, uh, because uh, just the just the word, just saying the word intifada, it already conjures, you know, images of violence, of uh, uh, hostility. Uh, so this is a this is a, a, a I think very important uh, in, in terms of this inclusive liturgy of destruction. Yes, and of course, I was there. I was in Jerusalem and elsewhere in Israel, Palestine during this time on many occasions. And uh, the question is who's, who's violence? Some uh, kids were throwing rocks or Israelis uh, shooting quote rubber bullets that destroyed uh, so many lives and uh, putting them in prison and these young people and older people uh, well, the Intifada was a very dignified response and mostly nonviolent and especially in terms, of, but then I also asked, do the Palestinians have a right to resist? This was, a, this was a problem for Jews. The idea that they could resist, that they had a right to resist, even violently for their freedom if they couldn't get it nonviolently, most of it was nonviolent. But Jews in general couldn't wrap their mind around Palestinians resisting because they always thought it was primarily to destroy Israel. And uh, that wasn't what it was about. But the idea that Jews could be opposed, our goodness could be opposed, and Eli Wiesel just couldn't sort it out, that Palestinians had a right to resist. And that there would be some violence in any resistance, including Jewish resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto. But we didn't see ourselves as conquerors. So how could you resist us unless you were anti-Semitic? And how could Jews resist the occupation without being self-hating? This is a, it seems like a no-brainer, but it wasn't a no-brainer. And you're knocking your, you, you're knocking your head against the wall saying to Jews, Palestinians have a right to resist our oppression. Um, it's every, every, every oppressed people. Well, I know, but I'm telling you, 1990, and yeah. sometimes even today, 
it's not understood within parts of the Jewish world, understood in parts of the Jewish world too. But the basic point is since we're good and Israel is good, any resistance must be a form of anti-Semitism. Not the resistance that you would find anywhere, including among Jews when we were oppressed. Okay, very uh, fraught. Okay, and uh, now let's uh, look at the. Uh, uh, okay, this is a, this is another part of, uh, of uh, that is very interesting uh, in this. Uh, section about uh, you know Jewish res uh, Israel Israel's response to the uh, Palestinian uprising and uh, this was documented by uh, this uh, human rights uh, center al haq uh, and they uh, put it in a report called punishing a nation human rights violations during the Palestinian uprising uh, which uh, they published in 1988 and they said that during just during the first year, 204 Palestinians died and more than 30,000 were injured. So this is a very uh, you know brutal uh, uh, response, and uh, it's not just uh, and and that includes uh, responses include the formation of death squads, obstruction of medical treatment, administrative detention curfews, repression of education, and suppression of any organized activity. All of this, of course, as a Filipino, I'm very familiar with, uh, especially, uh, uh, especially during the martial law. And uh, also now, in terms of these dead squads and this, all of this uh, suppression. So, uh, I, and uh, you said that you were actually uh, um, uh, encountering the, the, the people here from Al Haq. Yes, in fact, I used to bring back uh, information again in the book that gets in the book from Al Haq and at the airport where they had this extreme security, uh, the women who were usually the first to interrogate you couldn't understand where this material I had was coming from, and it was allowed in Jerusalem at the time. We were One of the things about the uprising was that Israel was still open. It, it had the sense of democracy, and you could still travel to these areas even under curfew. Uh, Palestinians could publish information. Uh, I could bring it out in, in the airport uh, back to the United States. There was still, even though there was a lot of repression, it was much more open than it is now. And in fact, uh, after the uprising and all the publicity that happened, including the footage of demonstrations and of beatings that was around the world in the media, Israel closed it down. And now it's very, very difficult to do what I did in 1988, 89 and 90. And even though it was a very oppressive situation, I was traveling freely among Palestinians. Uh, and again, like the material from the Arab Christians, I brought that back from Cyprus. This information that Palestinians were recounting and collecting about the oppression of Palestinians, I brought that back and incorporated it into my writing. Uh, so there was a robust uh, Palestinian resistance and human rights uh, groups, just like Beth Selim, and sometimes they were working together. This is another part of the uprising. Mm -hmm. There were Jews, which we, we went through a little bit before, who were working with Palestinians mm -hmm. because they also wanted Palestinians to be free and the occupation ended. So this was a time when there were bridges being built between Jews and Palestinians too, even as it was being torn apart. But here's another point about these details, like holding up people, uh, Palestinians going needing hospital care. The details uh, that Al Haq was uh, recounting, and of course Beth Selim, the Israeli human rights group, was also, were even more horrific than the general sense of putting down the uprising. And this is, goes back to Shahak, atrocity as a method, but 
people, Palestinians were being stopped from going to the hospital. Uh, Palestinians were dying because they couldn't get health care. Not that health care wasn't there, they couldn't get to it. Uh, there were death squads. Uh, there were the use of informers. There were invasions of homes and cities. Uh, the details of the occupation were even worse than using the word occupation. That's kind of a generalized wor word. So, and of course there was torture. Uh, so now bringing home the fact that Israel had conquered Palestine and was occupying it, that was one thing, but that's a very general statement. But that Palestinians were being imprisoned, they were being chased down, they were denied medical care. They, th this stuff was more detailed and people could relate to it. You mean she had to go to the hospital to give birth to a baby prematurely, but they wouldn't let her through the checkpoint and so she died. Is that what you're saying? And again, if you didn't see Palestinians essentially as human and civilized, who cares? But if you saw them as individuals too, not just part of a collective, like we are individuals and part of a collective too, how could Israel stop pregnant women from going to the hospital? Could that be? How could Israeli soldiers who arrested these teenagers torture them? Arrest them then one thing, they threw rocks, so okay, and then tortured? What do you, so it was, a, it was a confrontation ultimately with what it means to be Jewish. This was a big deal. You think about, you know, with Christians, you just think, well, we know now about this history, so it doesn't surprise me that Christians made up the death squad to kill the Jesuits or that Christians said the Our Father before they killed this one or that one and that the sisters were raped and shot at point blank. You know, it, it, it's terrible, but people think, well, okay, they're not Christians. Well, they think they are. But for Jews to think this way, that all of a sudden we had become conquerors, that we would deny pregnant women or older women or cancer patients treatment. On the other hand, there were Israelis who were treating Palestinians who were wounded and Palestinians who were pregnant. And it's so it's all mixed up. What do you do with everything that's mixed up in terms of Jewish identity? Yes, okay. Uh, let's uh, continue. Um, and uh, this time we're going to the last section of the book, which is on Palestinian liber theology of liberation. And, uh, and here you um, uh, outline the, uh, the development of Palestinian theology of liberation. Uh, and uh, uh, the first one is uh, basically a, a Christian theologians responding to the 1967 uh, war. And, uh, and here you mentioned the, a group of uh, Christian theologians that included Father George Kodor, Metropolitan of uh, Mount Lebanon and Professor of Arab Civilization at the Lebanese University, Reverend Samir Kafiti, Martin Albert Laham, and Father John Corban. And they issued a memorandum with the title, What is Required of the Christian Faith? concerning the Palestine problem. And, and for them, there are three things that matter. The facts of the present situation that, and what led to them, the, uh, the Bible, what did the Bible say about the ideals of Judaism and Zionism and the ideas on a just solution to the uh, Palestinian uh, problem. And here is a, a, a quote from that memorandum. I find this very interesting. And this is how they uh, see the, uh, you know, the, basically the responsibility of uh, Western uh, Christians. Because the Christians of Europe and America denied their responsibility for a million Jews who were their brothers, they threw one million Arabs out of their homeland of Palestine. What have you done to your brother? In rejecting one million Jews and in despoiling one million Arabs, the Christians of the West have committed a double crime 
which cries to the heaven for redress. So that was the first stage. And then uh, 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 several years later, um, uh, the, these are coming from uh, 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 people like uh, Gabriel Habib. Uh, you uh, mentioned him already early on. And this is, um, uh, of course, uh, the, you mentioned a very important incident involving uh, Habib. Uh, and this is uh, very controversial about his refusal uh, to an invitation to present a paper at an international symposium on the Holocaust? Yes, this was in the volume um, that Irving Greenberg wrote his very wonderful and disturbing essay, which I came across. And it was at St. John's the Divine Cathedral. It's a big, uh, and it was, uh, edited by Eva Fleischner, whom I later met, and it was big with Elie Wiesel and all. And Habib was, I didn't know him then, this was in 1974, and uh, uh, he was invited, but uh, submitted rather a message. And I discovered it when I went to, and, or I, I, read the, I had read the book, but I discovered it again when I started going to Cyprus and I was meeting with uh, Gabby Habib, who was quite a character. And uh, he basically said, uh, you know, uh, Jews suffered, we're suffering. You, we, you need to get, you know, I'm not going to go there un under the sense that Palestinians don't exist or something like this. And it was completely out, it's published in the book, if I remember correctly. Anyway, I came across it. And these memos that you talk about from these Christians, I met them, this was part of the group I was meeting with in Cyprus. And they had a sense of the division of Western Christianity and Eastern Christianity, and that Jews had suffered under Western Christianity, but were now taking it out on Palestinians because the Christians in the West were repenting for the Holocaust, but who was suffering the Palestinians. Uh, and so this is a, a dichotomy, which I was experiencing when I was talking to Eastern Christianity and Christians and traveling with them we're not responsible for what happened to Jews in Europe. Why are we being held responsible by our own displacement? And uh, he's refusing to come there because he doesn't believe it's a balanced presentation. Not that Jews hadn't suffered, he recognized that, but that Palestinians shouldn't suffer, shouldn't be the last victims, as it said, of the Holocaust. Okay. And uh, of, of course, you also mentioned uh, uh, Naim Atik, Reverend Naim Atik, a Palestinian uh, theologian who wrote uh, a book, uh, Justice and Only Justice, a Palestinian Theology of Liberation. And uh, I, I saw this uh, photo from your Facebook. And can you, can you tell us about this meeting? Uh, uh, when was this and what was the uh, uh, occasion for, for this meeting? I think that was during the uprising when that photo was taken and I was traveling there. And uh, I have a long history with Naim Atik that goes back to 1987, mm -hmm. where I gave uh, my book launch of Toward a Jewish Theology of Liberation. And Naim Atik was asked to respond to me, to be a respondent but he refused. He was tired, as he said, of progressive Jews who he felt were very paternalistic. And uh, Kathy Bergen, who was taking me around, who was a Mennonite, convinced Naeem not to respond to me, but to come to hear me because she thought I was different and he should hear what I had to say. And so the audience was packed. This is in Jerusalem. And there's Naeem Atik, probably one of the few Christians. Uh, and he's a... Uh, Israeli citizen, but Palestinian, whose family was driven out of his village, but who remained within the state of Israel. And there he was with his clerical clothes, black, if I remember correctly, and his cross, sitting in this group, very identifiably different than most of the people there who were Jews, Jewish Israelis. 
And he liked what I had to say very much and invited me back to his apartment. Uh, and uh, maybe the first Jew to be in his apartment and gave me a mimeographed copy of his dissertation, which turned out to be ultimately this book, Justice and Only Justice. And he asked me what I thought about it. I took it back to my hotel room and read it that night. And I told him I would bring it back to the United States if he wanted me to, and that I would ask Orbis Books, which was part of Marinol, to publish it. And ultimately they did. And we brought Naeem Atik to Marinol to rewrite parts of it. And we went through it chapter by chapter, almost page by page. It was one of the great moments in a new interfaith ecumenical solidarity of Palestinian and Jew learning together and challenging each other. And he challenged me on a number of points and I did on him. So we developed a friendship which has lasted to this day uh, and Orbis published Justice and Only Justice and in his analysis, he included Toward a Jewish Theology of Liberation or some of the thoughts in there. And we've worked together. It's very controversial because Naeem, his Christianity, his Christian theology was very uh, old fashioned in my view and very much um, almost a replacement theology but I was, uh, and so he was considered by many Jews because he was beginning to speak in the West as anti-Semitic, but this was his experience of Christian theology, but also he didn't want to give Jews too much space because they were taking up too much space. In fact, his family had been directly oppressed by Jewish Israelis and to that day. So he had a thing about Jews in what they had done and his theology was old fashioned in my view, but I was working with him because he wanted to move forward and I wanted to move forward as a Jew and a Christian. He's an, Episcop an Anglican priest and a beautiful man, very pastoral, even toward me at times. And I have some beautiful stories about Naeem Ati comforting me. In fact, uh, I'll tell the story. This is some years later, we were at Garrett Theological and there was a service, a liturgy of destruction, which emphasized the destruction of Palestine. And it was done as a liturgy. Rosemary Ruther was there, whom I worked with quite a bit and others. And there were readings from the destruction of Palestine, from the exile of Palestinians, including Naims. And I was shaken by it. Now I had written all of this and this was after nine, this was probably at the time I was writing Beyond Innocence and Redemption or just after. So I had written about an inclusive liturgy of destruction, but hearing it in a church and absorbing it. And I remember walking out and everyone was walking out back to Garrett from the church and I was walking alone and Naeem came up to me and put his arm around me and talked to, you know, So uh, we, we developed a, a deep friendship, but it wasn't simple for him or for me uh, because uh, he had views of Jews from his experience, which I didn't deny, but I wanted to make sure that he didn't extrapolate that to all Jews, which he didn't want to, but he didn't know how to. And he had some things, uh, and I had some, you know, it was it was it was not simple, but I wanted to stay in, and he wanted to stay in. And I've written about it at times, and I think it's one of the breakthroughs to an interfaith ecumenical solidarity that is very little known, and may have been the deepest immersion of Jew and Palestinian Christian uh, in history. A very important moment, in my view. Yeah. And uh, uh, Reverend Atika was at your festival. Uh, yes, in Israel. 
a, an essay for the book. So we, we've, uh, and he's grown and I've grown. We've grown. Naeem and I have grown together. Yeah. And, um, and that's why I think it's, uh, uh, there's something, uh, yeah, putting those books together in, in the slide that I showed. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a, uh, because his book, I've read this book too, uh, Justice and Lonely Justice. It's also a liturgy of the destruction. Yes. Uh, so uh, both he, books really represent an inclusive. Yeah, uh, his inclusion, my inclusion of his work was controversial, but my, his inclusion of my work was controversial because many Palestinians didn't want to hear about a Jewish theology of anything. And understandably, or about the Holocaust. They didn't want to hear about it, and I don't blame them. So I took risks by associating with Naeem, and Naeem took risks by associating with me, and we were the risky brothers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, and so we. Uh, uh, wrap up this discussion with you know the the last paragraph uh, in in the in chapter four. So uh, the, uh, you brought it that you brought them together, brought them up together, in in this paragraph. Um, for Christians after the Holocaust, Johann Baptist Metz wrote. We Christians can never go back behind Auschwitz. To go beyond Auschwitz, if we see clearly, is impossible for us by ourselves. It is possible only together with the victims of Auschwitz. Uh, for Jews today, it might be said, we Jews can never go back behind empowerment. To go beyond empowerment, if we see clearly, is impossible for us by ourselves. It is possible only together with the victims of our empowerment, the Palestinian people. Thus, the inclusive liturgy of destruction sees the history of Palestinian and Jew as now intimately woven together, the bond of suffering as the way forward for both peoples. So that ends the, the chapter. And, it's, uh, uh, and so the next chapter would be about uh, uh, Holocaust, Israel, and Christian renewal. But the, this chapter, chapter four, about the inclusive liturgy of this destruction is, is probably the heart, uh, the heart of the book, uh, I, 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 might, I would say. And, uh, and, and I think this is, this is really the part in the book where you, could, you, you would feel the tension, you feel the sadness, you, you, you feel, and, the, and you would also feel hope, especially with ending that with, uh, 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 with uh, Naima Thick's uh, uh, Palestinian theology of liberation. Yeah, yeah very, uh, beyond innocence and redemption, but maybe most of my writing and even my celebration of Jewish holy days and the Sabbath I remember reading the prayers uh, for Shabbat around the dinner table with the kids. And I thought to myself, I'm chanting this in a way of mourning. Even so I'm mourning for the end of Jewish innocence and the end of Israel as a form of redemption. And I'm mourning uh, the squandering of Jewish history through the oppression of another people. So that's one part. That's a big part of Beyond Innocence and Redemption and a big part of my writing and my life, mourning what we have squandered. But I've always also held out an opening for a change of direction or tried to hold open opening so that what, what has been squandered is squandered, our witness as a suffering people, it's over. But that doesn't mean Jewish is over. And Palestine has been conquered by Israel. It's a permanent occupation, but it doesn't mean that Palestinian life is over. So it's a very difficult situation, an impossible situation, but life goes on. And there's always the possibility that history will open to a new path. 
This book is a witness to the squandering and to the possibility of Jewish history. Uh, what will happen with that witness uh, beyond my life, I don't know. Uh, but it's a narrative remembrance. It's bringing together all of these diverse strands that I could find at the time as I experienced most of them. I tried to bring them together so that they could be remembered as a possible, as a possibility of a new path. And 30 years later, going through this with you, hour after hour, uh, I, I don't think I could do it again. Uh, this is the last time. And I'm glad that I've had this time. But it brings back many memories of uh, haunting memories of uh, my own vulnerability, my own hope, my own hopelessness, others who are hopeful and hopeless. And it's, it's, it's a, a mix that's, that I can't go through again. What will happen to this witness? Uh, you're bringing it back to life, which I'm grateful for. Uh, and maybe it will die with me as other witnesses die with other folks, but uh, so I don't know. Um, there's a sadness in going through it again and a trauma and maybe one day a hope too, again.